Hello, everyone, and it's good to have you back on the First Mind podcast. I would love to welcome our returning guest, Dr. Cynthia Lewis Wallace, is here with us again. And we are going to be talking about domestic violence today. Um, We're actually doing a pivot. We were planning to have an episode around the topic of grief and the stages of grief. October 31st um, is the birthday of my dad who has passed away. So in order to honor him, I had intended to do this episode on grief. But because it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I wanted to make sure that we did touch on this topic on the podcast. So we are making a pivot. Um, I think my dad would be very proud of this change in the podcast plan. My dad was a huge champion of women and an advocate for women, not that women are the only people impacted by domestic violence, but um, he was just a huge supporter of us respecting one another and, um, you know, not acting out violently towards each other. And um, he was just an awesome human. So I think he would be proud that we are doing this episode. So um, again, I want to welcome our guest, Dr. Cynthia Lewis Wallace. If you were not able to catch her um, on our first episode where we discussed attachment styles, please go and check that out. We are uploaded on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube, so you can actually listen or watch depending on whatever you prefer. Um, So yeah, let's get into it. Of course, my questions are no longer up here. Um, All right, so... Welcome, Dr. Cynthia Lewis Wallace. And our first question is Can you describe for our audience how you would define domestic violence and maybe talk a little bit about who is impacted by this type of abuse? Yeah, thanks again for having me um, and being on this important episode. And I think also agree this is, I think, a great way to, to honor and celebrate your father. Um, when I think about, yeah, absolutely. Uh, think about domestic violence. It boils down to controlling behavior and maintaining power, right. Um, in regards to the perpetrator or abuser. Um, so I may just use those words interchangeably. Um, but it is ultimately in a relationship. Um, initially domestic violence, we talked about violence that took place within a household. So whether that was, um, uh, spouse or um, or it could be siblings, it could be aunts between anybody in that household. What we also now um, kind of use the language and refer to as intimate partner violence. Um, so it is romantic partners that may be in the same household, may not. Um, and so you may hear intimate partner uh, domestic violence used as well. And so ultimately is when the abuser tries uh, to maintain uh, control and power. And it's a pattern, right? So it's not just one time, it happens over and over and over again. Um, And so we think about who is impacted by this uh, pattern of behavior. It's anybody, right? So one in four women um, experience, right? Physical violence or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. One in four men also do. Um, does not matter what your ethnicity is, does not matter what your sexual orientation is, does not matter where you come from as far as SES, so um, socioeconomic status. So this is one thing where um, it does not discriminate. Um, And so therefore it becomes an everyone's, you know, concern. And so hence having this awareness month is super important. So I'm glad that you're that we're having that conversation and talking about it. I'm so glad that you um, touched on the fact that it impacts anybody and everybody. I think that in our current media, it seems like there's this misconception that domestic abuse or intimate partner violence tends to impact um, people who maybe are not educated, people who come from impoverished backgrounds. Um, You know, you sometimes will hear in current media people saying, well, they must, you know, 
like that abuse or they must not be smart enough to leave and things of that nature. And I really want to work to dispel that misconception in this episode because the majority of clients who I have worked with who have suffered in this way and myself included in my early 20s, I was also experiencing an intimate partner violence in terms of a relationship. But these are clients who are well-educated, clients who are middle to upper class, um, you know, and really, I think, are deeply impacted by the psychological impacts of this type of abuse. And that is what keeps them, um, you know, kind of stuck in this cycle. And so I know that we'll touch on that and get to talk about that later, but I did just want to say that this is absolutely an issue that can impact anybody. So I'm so glad that you said that. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. So what are some of the signs of domestic abuse and what are the different types of abuse that victims may endure? Yeah. So we think about... some of the signs of domestic abuse um, and then the different types of abuse. So first I want to kind of just kind of talk about the various different forms of abuse. And then I actually want to go a step bur- uh, further and kind of talk about what would that actually look like uh, from an abuser as far as, you know, and so we talk about violence, right? And so violence can take many forms. It could be physical, right? So kind of what we're familiar with hitting, slapping, spitting, Uh, emotional and verbal um, abuse. So insults, humiliation, um, ridicule, silent treatment, um, attempts to scare or intimidate somebody. Again, ultimately, the main purpose is for the abuser to maintain this power of control and also mean and power. So they kind of go hand in hand. So they maintain this through these kinds of different forms of, of abuse. Um, sexual abuse, right? So non-consensual um, uh, assaults, pretty much without the, the survivor's um, consent. Um, just because they're in a relationship for in some circumstances does not mean that consent is automatic. Um, mm-hmm. So sexual abuse, financial abuse. So whether that is withholding money, not paying their bills, um, limiting a person's access to their, their own bank account, um, digital abuse. So that could look like, inter- you know, access to or limiting access on the social medias or emails or the internet, um, text messages. Uh, that also kind of goes into, for example, like um, abuse could be using text messages to um, provide verbal abuse, but it also could be to kind of try to, to manipulate whether that means limiting who that person can talk to in regards to their family or friends, um, speaking on behalf of them to other people. Um, and and another kind of form of abuse is stalking. So putting GPSs on your car, right? Or air tags on your, in your clothing or in your luggage or whatever it may be so that they're keeping track on where you go and all of your movements. Um, You know, literally stalking you, right? Stalking your text messages, stalking your emails, your social media, all of those are kind of different forms of abuse. And so sometimes we may just think, well, they didn't hit me. So I'm good, right? And reality is that here we are, and here's all different forms of abuse that go beyond just the actual physical, um, you know, um, we, we kind of hear as kind of the hitting, um, the one that we kind of talk more about, you know, uh, whether it's being strangled or, you know, physically assaulted, and just also being aware that there are various other forms of abuse. Um But one of the things I also wanted to make sure I kind of mentioned is how abusers speak is also really important. And um, there's a quote that um, Dr. Maya Angelou had said that I think it just resonates. She said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Right. And so I think listening to how people talk, i.e. specifically abusers of talk, is really important because it's really demonstrating who they are. Right. So what does that actually look like? Um, So phrases that are like red flags, Um, you can go, but I don't want you to go, 
Or, you know, you would be very pretty. You'd be so much prettier if you lost 10 pounds or you didn't wear those types of clothes um, or if you did your hair a certain way. Right. Again, that control piece. Um, or, you know what? I bring the money in this household, so I'll decide how we want to spend it. Or, you know what? You don't need a you don't need a bank account. I will take care of your bills and make sure everything is paid for. So somebody who may be like, oh, wow, that's that's very sweet of it. Uh, sweet of that person to do that. Right. Like they're trying to take care of me. They're looking out for me. But again, it also boils down to this desire to maintain power and control over you. Right. And so if I have pretty much um, sole responsibility and ownership of your finances, now you're kind of dependent upon me. Right. You can't really you're not going to leave anytime soon, because if I'm your financial kind of uh kind of resource that also is a, is a, is a piece that's going to, as an abuser, it's going to maintain that power that I have. Um, another phrase that I think that's, you know, like, you know, um, couples don't need to have secrets. So therefore, you know, like we can have both have, or I can have access to your social media accounts, your passwords, your emails, etc. cetera. Um, if you're not hiding anything, then it shouldn't be a problem, right? These are phrases that are red flags because at the bottom of all of these is, again, this control and power, which is pretty much when we think about domestic violence or intimate partner violence, that is at the source, is wanting to control another person's behavior and continuously do everything you possibly can to maintain that power. Yes, and I think, you know, because some of those phrases could be said by somebody who is not abusive, right? You could meet a man who is going to take care of your bills and pay everything. And that genuinely is his intention. And he's, you know, not meaning to abuse that power. But what I would probably say in my experience is if the person is outlining certain rules, if you will, for Mm -hmm. you that do not apply to themselves, So for example, I remember being in a relationship and it's so funny because when we started the episode, I said I was in a domestic, an intimate partner, abusive relationship in my twenties. But really when I think about it, I referenced that relationship as abusive because it was, there was physical abuse. Mm -hmm. But now I'm about to give you an example that of a relationship that had no physical abuse, but still, as you're describing some of these um, phrases, these were things that were utilized in this relationship. So no physical abuse, but now I'm recognizing and identifying that this also was an abusive situation. But I remember being in a relationship and one of the rules was there were three men in our community that this, my partner at the time did not want me to speak to. One of them, I hadn't, I don't, I didn't even know the person, but like, this was somebody who he had some issues with. So we would see them out socially and he asked me not to speak with them. And then there was two other people who I did know. Um, one I had had uh, dealings with like long before I met this person. And then another one was just a person who I knew like in passing, but I was asked not to speak to these people because this partner did not like these people. And what Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember was there was like a situation where somebody who he used to date came around and he was like very friendly and sweet and talking to them. And like, you know, I asked, like he didn't identify that this was a person he used to date, but then later that came out as we were having conversation. So then I kind of reframed that like, well, why do you get to talk to this person? And I have these rules, like I can't talk. And he was Mm -hmm. upset, like very upset that I would even consider taking Mm -hmm. away his privilege and his, you know, ability to talk to another female, but then he had all these rules for me. So I, so that does kind of give a different spin. Like if your intent is, you know, good, then it should be good for both of us. Like it shouldn't just be like, I have this set of rules and and you don't have to have any rules. Like that to me is when that kind of power and control comes into play. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. Right. And I think sometimes, again, I think it's also recognizing that like, yeah, like some of these things may be generally like, again, not necessarily linked to um abuse but i think i like that piece of well does it go both ways like so 
we both have access. And if the answer is no, well, then there's a red flag that, okay, yeah, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the psychological profile, if, if you will, of a person who would be abusive and maybe even a person who would be a victim of abuse. Maybe we should discuss both, but I want to kind of give the audience some idea of what an abuser might look like, like what, or what even, I guess, what would be the experiences that would make somebody abusive or however, you know, sure. you want to kind of answer that. Yeah. So first for, for first, I'm always going to, I'm always going to say that an abuser chooses their beha that behavior, period, right? So there really is no explanation or to excuse. Like, no, that's a choice that they make, period. But we also know is that there's certain risk factors that come into play uh, that include when we think about the abuser itself. So typically the abuser may have had abuse in their family. Uh, whether they witnessed it or it was uh, they were abused and it was they experienced it um, as a child. Um, we also know that abusers tend to lack coping skills, uh, healthy, healthy coping skills to manage whatever, um, you know, difficulties or stressors that they're that they're dealing with. Slow self-esteem. They may have very few friends. There may may also be isolated, which is hence why a lot of times abusers tend to try to isolate their partners. Um, they also um, may experience substance abuse um, or uh, codependency. So then again, they're heavily dependent or reliant upon this one person who becomes everything. And so therefore this need to control this person because can't let this person leave. And so again, it goes back to maintaining that power and control. So we know that there's risk factors. Doesn't mean that just because you have these risk factors, you're, you're going to go on to be abuser, right? But we know that these risk factors increases the likelihood of someone becoming an abuser. And a lot of times it's those survivors of abuse who often, you know, become, um, and not always, but in some circumstances, you know, the, the, the perpetrator of, of abuse. Um, and so, again, I'm always going to go back to abuse is a, a choice, you know, uh, a behavior that they're making. But we also know that these risk factors are, you know, um, something to consider. So um, and, and initially in a, in a relationship, you may not necessarily it, most times most people come across very charming and very sweet and very personable. Right. Um, so it's kind of like, oh, this person is not like the horrible person that we hear in the, in the news and in the media and, and so forth. And eventually, the longer you, you know, you're into the relationship, you start to see those signs and it starts to come out. And then you see kind of all of these various different forms of abuse, you know, so they are willing again to do whatever they need to, to do to con maintain that power. Right. Um, and so. Um, whether it may look like jealousy or not taking responsibility for their actions or blaming the other person. Um, so it starts to that whole Mr. Nice or what that Mrs. Nice person, very personable, sociable, um, starts to kind of show underneath the true person, kind of like what Dr. Maya Angelo mentioned. Um, and so like you only can hold and maintain that for so long, um, and then your your true authentic self starts to come through. And so those are the things to kind of to kind of be aware of. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the terms that we would use is love bombing. Right. So when you talk about kind of that charm and that initial um, facade and kind of over the top niceness, mm -hmm. you know, like almost if you really were paying attention, it would probably seem fake, you know, like you would be able to recognize that it, it's too good to be true, if you will. And then, yeah, I think that um, that kind of draws you in and sucks you in, it, it, you know, because they are so accommodating, they are so sweet, they are so charming, they are so nice. Um, and in my experience, once I'm in, I then spend, you know, the next year, two years, three years, trying to get us back to that very beginning mm -hmm. when it was so nice, you know, like, I think that's what, you know, when I talk even to clients, like it's 
always kind of that, I wish we could get it back to where it was in the beginning, but there is no getting it back to where it was in the beginning because the beginning wasn't real. Exactly. Right. It's, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, I think there's, it's kind of a form of manipulation, right? It's kind of like, what do I need to do to get you? And now that I have you, therefore, how do I continue to maintain this, this power and control? Yes. And I do love that you said that it is a choice because that is also mm-hmm. something that I think is a misconception in that, you know, we as, um, you know, we often feel like, well, they're this way because they were abused. And it kind of makes you have this empathy and this, like, you know, I, you feel bad for them because they went through, right. you know, some sort of trauma or tragedy or something. But as you said, I think we all come into the world with some trauma, tragedy, exactly. you know, some kind of experience. And some of us are able to regulate. Some of us, when we're not able to regulate, we go get help and support to figure out how to regulate. So if you're choosing not to get the help and the support that you need to be a better person and to regulate your anger and your jealousy and your insecurities, that is a choice. Like you are actively choosing not to get the help and the support that you need for whatever reason, which is why that trauma cannot be an excuse. It is a choice. I'm so glad that you said that. Um, so what are some of the psychological impacts of experiencing domestic abuse and why is it so challenging for victims to leave these situations? Yeah. And you know, and I, you mentioned victim, but I, I'm going to kind of choose a different empowering word and say survivor, you know? Thank and you. so why do survivors, <clears throat> excuse me, have a difficult time, but let me get to the first part where you mentioned some, what are some of the psychological impact, right? So we know that survivors tend to blame themselves for the abuse they received, right? Because a lot of times it's the perpetrator who's saying, no, like I'm behaving this way because you did X, Y, Z, right? It's kind of this blaming, no responsibility of accountability for their own actions, putting that on to the survivor, right? So then the survivor starts to think like, man, what, maybe I did, what did I do to piss the person off, you know? And realizing nothing. The answer to that is nothing. Again, it's a choice that this abuser is choosing to make. You know, and so, but a lot of times there's a lot of self-blame. There's a lot of self-criticism because a lot of times, again, the abuser is cr- very critical um, and, and, and many times negative. And so we tend to internalize some of that ourselves. Um, we also know that some survivors ex- it, it end up experiencing very self-destructive behaviors. So what does that actually look like? It could be engaging in self-harm behavior. So whether that's cutting, burning themselves, hitting themselves, um, it can even ha- lead to thoughts of suicide I and mean, just not wanting to be here anymore. Um, we know that it also um, increased anxiety, depression, um, chronic abuse can actually even create uh, trauma responses, you know, um, that also then impact the relationship that a survivor has not only with another partner, but also with their kids, family members, you know, and et cetera. So it has a significant psychological impact. Um, And sometimes it may not necessarily be recognizable initially, right? Because if you're in it on the day, it's very hard to see these, these things happening in your life, you know? Um, But um, the continued pattern, think about it, the continued and chronic pattern of abuse over extended period time is going to have a a significant impact. You know, um, I I just can't see how how you're not. Um, And so being able to get to the point where you're able to recognize these impacts to be like, okay, something, I got to do something about it. Right. And I think that's the piece that kind of leads to the next question is like, why is it so challenging for survivors to leave? Um, And I think you had posted uh, some stats on social media. They range um, on the average is like seven to 11 attempts before a survivor permanently leaves their partner. Right. Um, And so there's so many different variables as to why survivors, it takes that many attempts, right? So it could be for the fact that, hey, you know what, like danger, right? Like there is this high level of danger to leave, you know, um, and that the abuser, you know, um, 
can 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 cause significant harm, right? Uh, the other challenge is like if you have children involved, and so therefore, sometimes you know I've had clients say like you know like they're a great father but a crappy partner, you know. So therefore, it's kind of like well, at least the kids still have their father, you know. And so for some people, like wanting that their children to have both parents in their household but at all costs is more important. Um, so they're willing to kind of sacrifice themselves in that process. Um, or the perpetrator has already created this um, isolation. So then therefore, like the survivor doesn't really have connections with family or friends. And so they are, they're isolated themselves, lack of resources, um, stigma, just the fact of leaving this partner, right? And again, if you have, if this perpetrator portrayed to friends and family and coworkers as this very like great person and very jovial and very personable and it's kind of like, well, how are people going to view me if I choose to leave this relationship, you know, um, or just kind of be this perception or having a negative perception, um, is something that may also be a barrier for folks. Um, also, this hope for change. Like, things are going to get better. Like, you know, like, it could be worse. It was worse. Things are actually moving better. Like, I'm sure that this person is going to change. Um, and so we are, we're hoping for this change to happen that just may never come, right? Um, and then also, there's some um, individuals who are in relationships who... Um, legally, like, so immigration status, right? Like, I literally cannot leave this relationship because um, I may end up having to get deported, right? So there's there's really big, significant, like, legal pieces to that. So there's a lot of different reasons why people stay. <clears throat> and again, if we're talking that the average is seven to 11 attempts before someone permanently leaves, right? That's pretty significant, which speaks to how challenging it is. And so um, so when people say like, like, I don't know, why don't you just leave? Right. It's not that easy. Right. And so um, and again, it may be someone who perfectly has enough resources. Right. So we talked about how it crosses SES. And so it may not be resources as the issue. Like I, I'm, I may be good on that. Right. But maybe children is the biggest piece or the fact that like, um, again, what is my family going to think? There could be a wide range of reasons as to why. Um, people choose to choose to stay. And it may just be the fact of like, hey, like I need to have a plan, right? Like I realized that like I need to think this through <clears throat> so that when I actually make that final attempt, like I am, that it is final. And then I'm, there, there really is no kind of going backwards. Yeah. And I just, I don't know if, well, first let me say, I love the reframing of not using the word victim and instead using survivor. Um, thank you for that. Um, you know, I think that it really is sometimes an experience that is very hard to understand and appreciate if you have not experienced it or known somebody, you know, intimately yourself who has experienced it. Because even in my own education about domestic violence, and I've done trainings and I've, um, you know, worked in um homes that, you know, house women of, you know, who are trying to escape these situations. So I've done extensive work with um, survivors in my younger years. And there was a lot of things that came out in those trainings that were even surprising to me, you know, in terms of not just statistics, but just in the way that I am supposed to support a woman who is going through this situation. So um, you know, I think it's really hard to put it in perspective if you haven't really experienced it. But I would say, you know, one of the things recently that happened that kind of was jarring to me, broadcasting that mm -hmm. happened. So there was a nationwide alert that came through our phones. I don't know if you recall, rather recently, they were testing the national alert system. And so when that was, you know, um, about to happen, my child sent me like a, a heads up, you know, that this 
national broadcast alert was going to come through our phones at two o'clock or whenever it was supposed mm -hmm. to happen. And one of the caveats in this um, heads up that she sent me said, if you are a survivor of domestic violence, and I think it used the word victim, but I'm changing it now, given the knowledge you gave me, um, make sure that you have any, you know, phones that you're disguising or trying to, you know, hide from your abuser, make sure that you put that away so that, or turn it off so that, that you're not alerted. Yeah. So then like, sometimes I don't think I even am thinking about, cause that's not my life right now. You know what I mean? So like, I'm not even thinking about like something as simple as there's going to be a national broadcast. And if I am experiencing a person who is controlling and monitoring my phones and my social and all these things, and I have a phone, you know, that I'm using to contact my family because this person has cut me off from my family. I right. have to make sure that I have this phone turned. Like it was the crate, yeah, like it just kind of, you know, stopped me in my tracks. Like <laughs> it made me kind of think about, you know, what that must be like, you know? So we're not talking about, you know, somebody who necessarily is just getting, you know, got smacked one time and they choose right. to go. We're talking about like people who may be enduring, you know, months and years and like, you know, of control and, you know, somebody telling them how to move, how to walk, how to talk, how they, you know, and that over time mm -hmm. really does something, you know, to your brain. So, yeah. um, yeah. That yeah. was a moment where I was like, yeah, yeah. It's a lot. And thinking about like the risk that people with a national test call, right? The potential risk and lives that people are now technically put in, right? With just a national test call, right? Um, you know, and even also when we talked about the resources, but like, for example, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, like if you go on their website, there is an, you just hit this button, it'll automatically like erase the the, the web history um, and close out the, the website so that if the perpetrator chooses to monitor your emails to see if you're trying to actually get help, through, you know, through this resource, that there wouldn't be any um, way of, of kind of uh, tracking that back, you know? And so the fact of the matter, these are real life problems, right? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, it really kind of speaks to be in that um, environment, right? Whether, you know, long-term, it, it absolutely has a psychological impact, right? And if you also have kids, the impact that it has on them as well. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Um, so going into, um, kind of our last question, which is, um, a good segue into the topic that, you know, we just talked about, but how can we best support someone who might be experiencing this type of abuse? Yeah, I think that the, the biggest piece is, and it's hard, right. Um, is to be non-judgmental, right. Which is hard because I think you know, people are going to be like, well, why are you in it? Like have all these questions for somebody. Right. And then I think that's, that's the last thing that you actually want to, you know, ask a survivor. Right. But being able just to kind of understand. And um, one of the things that I also want to make sure is when you're talking to survivor, kind of asking them, are you, when they provide you information, <clears throat> are you providing information to, to, as a disclosure to me, or are you providing information to me as like, I'm deciding to act and you need some support on it, right? Those are very two different things. So they may be like, I'm just telling you what my situation is, but I don't need you to do anything for me. I'm just telling you, I'm disclosing that and sharing it with you because I've been keeping it inside. <clears throat> or it may be, hey, I'm sharing this with you because I need to take action. I need to do something. I need to come up with a plan. I need some support. So there's very two different asks. So I think getting that clarity could be really important. So are you asking because is it, you're, are you sharing this out of disclosure or are you sharing this as a deciding to act? And so therefore you need, because then now I need to know where, I, where I'm at, right? Because I'm going to approach that very differently. Um, so my support's going to look a lot different. <clears throat> so I think getting that clarity, because what you don't want is somebody <clears throat> disclosing something and then you're trying to then force this person or influence this person to take action. 
which may or not be where that person is at at that moment, right? Because um, I think a lot of times, <clears throat> especially if these are people that we care about, right? We want them to be safe. They, we want them to be well. And so, of course, there's this kind of knee-jerk reaction to, let, what do I got to do to keep you safe and help you? And that may not necessarily be where they're at. So you have to kind of honor where they're at, which is very hard, you know, very, very hard. One of the um, biggest challenges or, you know, something that was just very confusing when I was going through my trainings to help support women and men in these situations was one of the um, first things they tell us is we are not supposed to tell them to leave. Like, I am not supposed to tell somebody who is experiencing this type of abuse to leave the situation. And the reason they gave for that is because then I also become a person who is trying to control and exert some sort of power over them. So Mm -hmm. I am, you know, doing almost essentially the same thing that this other person is doing. I'm not allowing them to figure this out on their own. I'm taking their power away and I'm making a a decision for them, which is not what somebody in this, a survivor in this situation needs. And that was, that's a hard, that's a hard ask when you are dealing with somebody who you care very much and very deeply about. Um, Because, you know, you just, when you love somebody, you don't want to see them going through that. So that's hard. It is. It is, you know, and and so I think, you know, sometimes just even asking the question, how can I support you? Right. It's very open ended and it kind of puts the ball in the person's kind of court to decide what that looks like. You know, what that support looks like. And I guess I would also, um, you know, say it's okay if you don't have the emotional capacity to support somebody. Mm -hmm who is in a situation like that. You can absolutely um, direct them to places Mm -hmm. where they can get appropriate support because that is, you know, that is equally difficult and challenging for the person who is receiving that information. And sometimes we don't always have the capacity to help and support. Um, and, And I think, you know, what I hear often from people who are on the, receiving end of that information is they tend to start to get burnt out. Like, I think, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe they helped the person try to get out of the situation. The person got out and they went back. And that always becomes a source of contention of like, you know, I did all this to help you get out. And then you just, Mm -hmm. you just went back. And so now it becomes, you know, Mm -hmm. well, you're just going to go back. You're just going to, and you just gave us us a statistic that it takes seven to 11 times for people to leave these situations. So I think, you know, it's your, you can do both. You can honor this person and the friendship and the relationship you have with them. And you can also say, I don't have the capacity to hold space for this in right now, but here are some resources I want you to get, you know, I want to di- direct you to where you can get some support. Absolutely. And I, and, and I appreciate you kind of mentioning that, right? Because it's also recognizing <clears throat> that it doesn't not only impact the survivor, it also kind of impacts their circle, right? And everybody that, that you know, that they may view as supports. And I think being able to take care of yourself as a, as a, as a person of support and recognizing, like, I can also support you from this, from over here, right? Because mm-hmm. again, the burnout, you know, the emotional pain that it also causes the support person is, is significant as well. You know, and so I think that's a really good point of also recognizing, like, how do I take care of myself? What is my bandwidth capacity as well? You know, and and knowing that if it has happened before and the survivor chose a different kind of made a different choice, again, absolutely. Like, how can I support you? But maybe it may look a little bit different. Right. It may be different from the first couple of times to where, you know, what, I'm going to direct you to these resources and then ultimately empowering you to choose when, how you would like to access those resources. No, absolutely. Yes. Yes. And I think listening in and of itself is really healing. Like, I think, you know, sometimes 
I know that I've been in situations where a big part of my gearing up to leave was me just verbalizing what I was experiencing to a friend over and over. like, you know, and like sometimes not even realizing, you know, that I'm complaining, if you will, or, you know, I'm having all these issues and these angst and, but the talking, the, the verbalizing, the getting the words out and allowing another person to hear my experience and receive it and say, that's not love or that doesn't sound loving or that, that, that is sometimes a catalyst to making a decision to leave. So even if the only thing that you are able to do is to listen, I want to say that that is oftentimes also a huge support that non-judgmental listening is also Mm -hmm. just, you know, sometimes what a person needs, you know? So, yeah. Absolutely. You know, and and I think that that disclosure or just being able to share, I think it also is going to come with trust, right? And so, um, and that that kind of safety piece. And so, again, the fact that they're, they are disclosing this, I think is significant in itself. Um, You know, but then I think also like, it kind of, kind of what you mentioned is like, there is no sense of call to action on your end, right? I think sometimes it's kind of like, oh my gosh, if they're coming to me, then I got to do something about it to help them. And I think also kind of realizing, whoa, 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 right? Again, it goes back to, is number one, is this meant as a disclosure? Just need somebody to listen or I'm actually deciding to act and so therefore I need some support, you know, but also recognizing that just like you said, just being able to be present and listen in itself, I think is a significant you know, source of support for sure, you know, and, and a lot of times I'll have conversations with clients and they're kind of in this kind of ambivalent stage where they're not quite sure what they want to do. Um, and when you mentioned one mechanism of kind of moving toward a, toward <clears throat> an action step is when they just kind of say it and just kind of talk um, and hear themselves. And, and other times I'll ask, you know, especially the clients who have children, like, so if your child was going through something like this, what would you say to them? You know, and it's a very different response than they would for themselves. It's like, so it's interesting, right? So there's a discrepancy of you can tell me exactly how you would support your child, but you being in the situation is a very different. Why is there such a difference between what you would do for your child and for yourselves, you know? And then mm-hmm. I think that also kind of was like, hmm, I didn't really thought about that. Why is that? Why is that there two very different responses, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm just so thankful that we're having this, this um, conversation. And the, the one thing and the last thing I do want to touch on is resources that we can provide survivors, people who might be experiencing this form of abuse. Um, what are some suggestions or resources you might want to provide for them? Anybody who's yeah, listening well, who might be going through this? Yeah, so the National Domestic Violence Hotline um, says so 1-800-799-7233. Um, there's always someone available um, that they're actually trained, um, you know, so like when you call them, like there's going to be somebody who's who's very knowledgeable and understands kind of some of what we just kind of talked about in today's um, um, podcast episode. And so I think it's recognizing that this is somebody who, again, this is they've committed and they're very devoted towards supporting survivors. Um, and so the national uh, hotline. 24 um, seven. I think also kind of, we talk a lot about kind of seven to 11 attempts, right? And so um, thinking about a plan, right? And so I think being very kind of, um, kind of intentional about what that actually looks like, who are your sources of support? Um, how do I save up? Do I create a little bit, putting a stash of money away? Do I have a go bag? Um, where are the nearest, you know, um, crisis centers, you know, so I think being able to have those kind of details sorted out could be really, really helpful. And doesn't necessarily have to be like, this is my, my plan of action to a T, but I think having some type of plan or safety plan can be really, really helpful. Um, so what we also know is that we want to decrease the 
lethality of of leaving, right? I think that's the biggest piece because um, there is a significant danger. Somebody, again, the perpetrator is wanting to maintain control and power is willing to go above and beyond to do that in some, in some instances. And so there is this big piece of safety that's related to it, you know? So, um, but the hotline, when you call and speak to some of the, um, the staff there, like they're familiar, this is the world that they, that they're very knowledgeable and, and can even help create a safety plan um, and what that actually looks like. Um, and so maybe we realize like, Hey, you know what? <clears throat> I may not necessarily be ready to end this relationship now, but maybe I have a six month timeline. What would that actually look like? What are the resources that are in my area? Who could I talk to? Like they are a great resource. Um, also people who may decide like, Hey, you know what? Like I'm noticing there's certain patterns. Um, maybe not necessarily be this to the point where I think about like, my livelihood as far as life and death, but I'm realizing there's these patterns that I'm just not liking. And that may be another opportunity to get in therapy, right? And so being able to have those conversations with therapists, um, we're all mandated reporters. So um, meaning that um, if we, if a child or um, special uh, individual with special needs or an elderly adult is abused or neglected, we're mandated to report it. Um, but if you may decide to talk to your therapist to not provide that information, um, but say like, Hey, I just need some kind of guidance. You know, a therapist can also kind of be a good sounding board and also point you out to the various different resources. Um, you know, um, children, you know, and talking to their guidance counselor or their teachers. So it's somebody outside who kind of, kind of intervenes. So it's not necessarily me telling um, the police or whoever, but another, um, another entity could be able to do that on your behalf. Um, so there's various different kinds of ways to kind of support that. And can be, and we can, I think, recognize it can look very creative, um, but ultimately is the safety piece becomes really, really important. And so I think um, there's a lot of resources out there and they have done a really good job with trying to be really discreet. Um, because I think what we recognize in that this is, this is, like you said, this very serious topic and, um, incomplex and complex in that sense as well. Um, and I think I would want listeners to know, I, I know that sometimes when I've worked with clients, there's, especially clients who are married or have children, the anxiety of, um, the legality part of it. And you mm -hmm. talked about that a little bit, but when you reach out to um, these, the domestic violence center or a shelter or, you know, these agencies who are equipped to support people who are in these situations, they're also often connected to um, legal teams, legal aid. Um, so these are people who can really help you get a better understanding of what this all will look like for you legally in terms of your kids. I, at one time, I remember interning at a home that, was a um, shared pickup place for families who had protection orders against one another. So what that would look like is mom might drop the kids off at the house, leave, and then there would be staff, myself, one of them, who would keep the kids. And then 15, 20 minutes later, dad would come and pick them up. And the purpose of that was so that these two people who had a protection order against each other did not have to come in contact with one another. So there's many, many ways that this issue and this um, sort of situation can be addressed legally. So if your mm -hmm. fear or your concern or your anxiety is, you know, they're going to take my kids or how, will, or he's not going to, she's not going to allow me to have my kids or they're going to make this difficult for me. There are people who are knowledgeable about this process who can absolutely direct you to the right support so that you don't have to worry about that. So mm -hmm. that's just something else that I wanted to add. Yes. And if, as you were talking, it made me kind of think about like, especially with it, like for legal pieces, documentation, right? And so like um, keeping text messages and emails and voice recordings and whatever of those, you know, that you have available um, and not kind of destroying those and keeping those because that also I think could be really, really helpful um, at some point later down the road. Yeah. And so the last thing, 
I just want to say to anybody who is going through um, this this type of situation, I just want you to know that um, you are worthy, you are loved, that this experience does not make you not smart. This experience does not mean that you are somehow deserving of this treatment or this behavior. Um, and however you choose to navigate this situation, I want to hold space for you. I want to honor you. I want to um, know that you have people in the world who have also experienced what you're experiencing, who are cheering for you, rooting for you, advocating for you, and just hoping that you, um, you know, can get, get to a place where this does not have to be your experience. So. Yeah, absolutely. Any, yeah. Any last um, words that you want to say before we, before we get off of this, um, yeah. this episode? I think I would just add kind of what we mentioned before um, that abuse is a choice that an abuser chooses to make every single event, every single incident. That's a choice. Nobody is ever forcing him or her to do that, you know, and that um, there is literally nothing that a survivor can do to justify that period. You know, so I think I just really wanted to to kind of like make sure that I made that clear if I hadn't already, you know. Um, and so really um, kind of just kind of echoing on what you said um, and and that survivor, cyber, survivor in itself kind of speaks of empowerment and resilience. Right. Um, and those are really, really strong characteristics. Um, and so having that you know, and, and, and continuing to move forward, whatever that looks like at a timeline of your own choosing, I think is really, really important. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, very important topic. Um, if you or anybody, you know, is experiencing this, I encourage you to reach out to the resources that we've listed. Um, you can absolutely email M Wallace wellness at gmail.com. If you need some support and help and direct you to some resources, I would be more than happy to do that. But I'm hopeful that this episode has helped um, not just give survivors some insight, but also people who are just in the world and observing, you know, these experiences happening to other people, maybe have a little bit more compassion and empathy and understanding about what this is um, and how it can impact any of us. So Thank you all for listening. Thank you for joining. I look forward to seeing you on another episode of the First Mind Podcast. Let's heal. Take care.